Teacher and journalist Debbie Hayton. Debbie, good morning. Um, can we get your response to these findings? It's a very uh, contentious issue, this whole transgender thing, but there seems to be a degree of balance in what Dr Hilary Cass is saying. Would you agree? Well, there is. What comes over from this report is that Hilary Cass cares about children and she wants the best for children, uh, irrespective of who these children are or uh, what situation they're in. Children are at the centre of it. And Debbie, what would you say about the children, the, sorry, the fact that this is such a contentious issue, it's dominating the front pages of the newspapers today, and yet there are fewer than 100 children who are actually been prescri prescribed these puberty blockers. Many children also who are not trans who have been prescribed them for, for various different reasons. Why do you think it is that it seems to cause such a stir when considering it's very, very few people that it actually affects? Uh, it affects many more than the hundred people that have been uh, that have been <clears throat> commented on there. There's children who have been prescribed uh, puberty blockers by uh, private providers, perhaps because the uh, waitlist for NHS services is so long. That, incidentally, is a, is an issue which needs to be talked about now. The CAS review refers to NHS England. Private providers can carry on doing what they like on these uh, uh, here without uh, legislation or other uh, other means to uh, instruct them to stop. And then beyond that, there are children who are living in the hope of this magic treatment. Children, perhaps with complex and different and difficult needs, have been told that. Uh, uh, gender is the answer to your problems. And uh, there's this treatment available which will solve those problems, but you've got to work for it. The psychological impact on those children must be profound, and yet we've consigned them to waiting lists. That's a scandal as well. Debbie, I was speaking um, uh, earlier to several people and I asked the same question. Love your response to this. I, I would never disrespect genuine people who need to go through that process. As I said earlier, I think it's a process that should not just be, oh, let's make a medical judgment straight away. Psychologically, as you said, very important. Um, it's become a bit fashionable, hasn't it, if we're being completely honest? Well, there was... Ab Abigail Schreier wrote a book, Irreversible Damage, that talked about the contagion that was going on, you know, the, the social contagion that was going on, especially in groups of girls, a group that had never really come on the radar of... Uh, of transgender uh, gender identity clinics. Uh, mainly it was middle-aged men. Then suddenly these teenage girls applied, uh, appeared. And the same rules seem to be applied to that group as what had been hitherto applied to middle-aged men. People who were perhaps were old enough and mature enough to know the consequences of these actions. And then meanwhile, the evidence was always the case that most children presenting with distress about their sex grew out of it. Uh, this, these, this is a scandal that everybody knew this, or those in the field knew this, but still they went along with this treatment. And Debbie, where do you stand on the difference between sort of under 16s, 16 to kind of 20, and then much older adults having access to this treatment? Do you think that that is the issue for you, the fact that there are younger people who want to go down this pathway, but where you would think that it was a good idea for people who were above the age of 18, for example, to follow... When having, do you know your own mind, is, I guess, what we're trying but, to say. But obviously, bearing in mind that what this report and what the story we're talking about specifically is about puberty blockers. Now, you can't block puberty once it's actually happened. Uh, well, these, these drugs have been applied to the under-16s, under and that, that's, uh, that is, that's, is a scandal. But when we talk about adults and children, we often draw a line between adults and children for many things. And I think the best, uh, the best analogy I think I can come across here is with sterilisation procedures. If a 35-year-old man goes to the uh, NHS and says, I've had three children, can I have a vasectomy, please? The NHS is probably going to say yes. If an 18-year-old boy turns up and says, uh, I don't think I'm going to want any children, can I have a vasectomy? The NHS is going to say no, go away and come back later. Uh, yet this treatment has a, probably an even more profound effect on young people's bodies and their future fertility. Uh, but we seem to have applied different rules to this, and that's what's that's the problem. Absolutely well, fascinating. Thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Debbie. This really good. Debbie Hayton, transgender teacher and journalist, well, political correspondent at Politics Joe, Ava Santina, and former political advisor Leon Emerali are in the studio with us. Ava, your response to uh, to what Debbie said there.
I think there's a really big part of this report that hasn't been spoken about this morning, which is talking about local services and how they were afraid of the toxicity around the debate. And so they were referring children straight, uh, straight away to gender identity clinics rather than um, g uh, giving them access to mental health clinics. And I think that's a really big gap here because there might be a child that's experiencing gender dysphoria and that child should be going into therapy. That child should be going into support services that's absolutely. going to help them. Instead rather of have, than... a, have a puberty blocker, well, absolutely. Well, look, you know, in some cases, it might be right for a child to have, to, to have access to a puberty blocker or for that, for that uh, conversation to be had. Yeah. But in the majority of cases... But there's processes feels, before that. I think feels, that's what this report Absolutely, it feels right. Says, but what, what, but what's interesting about this report, though, as well, is it's talking about this holistic approach that we need to have to gender dysphoria. And it's like, OK, but those services aren't there. They're not available. And this speaks to the one wider mental health conversation that we've been having for years, which is that there simply isn't the capacity to look after people, particularly children at the moment. Mm. And Leon, it would appear to have been quite scathing, the, uh, <clears throat> the report against the toxicity of the trans debate. But mm. are we really surprised when members of parliament, the prime minister during PMQs, uses trans people, he would argue, not as the butt of the joke, but certainly the subject of the joke? Yeah, I think that's a fair point, Nicola, that there is a lot of toxicity. It's a very divisive issue and I think the reason for that is that politicians can see that they can get a little bit of political headway by essentially politicizing what is an issue that does affect a fairly small number of people but for them in their lives it is the biggest thing naturally so I think we have to be sensitive about what those issues are and I think Ava's hit the nail on the head you, what with puberty blockers you're essentially trying to solve a psychological issue with a medical and physical mm -hmm. process, and that can't be right. No, and I th think it has we're going to be a much more detailed process. From I think so. To end, psychologically, in terms of counselling, completely. Yeah, yeah. we're going to look back on this period potentially in a few years' time and think, what on earth were we doing?